Good morning and welcome to Asia Society. I'm Philip Ivanov. I'm a senior fellow at our Policy Institute and also Chief Programming Officer at the Asia Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you all this morning, beautiful New York morning, to uh, a very special program which we titled Brothers Forever Unpacking China-Russia Relations. Our program today is uh, really a discussion about what's going on between Beijing and Moscow, but it's also the launch of the new initiative by our Center for China Analysis, which will examine this rapidly evolving partnership between China and Russia. And through this initiative, which I'm very excited to drive here, um, we'll survey ideological, strategic, political, economic drivers of the relationship. And we also examine the Chinese and Russian perspectives of each other, of their partnerships, and how they view the world. Um, this week, we're launching the first four papers um, of this project, which will examine forces that are unifying and dividing Russia and China, and uh, how they've been accelerated or disrupted by the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, European perspectives on China and Russia relations. We'll discuss China's calculations on the um, Sino-Russia relations and whether Beijing's support for Moscow is actually declining. Uh, and we're also going to look at the Xi Jinping's shifting strategy when it comes to the partnership with Moscow. And we have three of our authors um, of these papers with us today, which I'll introduce you uh, later. Our program today is also occurring um, on uh, the week before a reported but unconfirmed visit by President Vladimir Putin to Beijing for the Belt and Road Initiative Forum. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, um, and we dive into this discussion, uh, let me just set the scene for, for this conversation. Um, since Chinese and Russian presidents stood together uh, in February 2022 on the eve of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the relationship between Beijing and Moscow uh, has really captured global attention. And it sort of goes from uh, a, a dismissal, there's nothing to see here, to mm -hmm. Russia and China together are going to conquer the world and unseat the United States and the rest of the Western world. So it's a very almost bipolar discussion about what are they, that they're doing together. Um, but in fact, China and Russia have been growing closer together for uh, almost four decades, um, right from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And today, their relationship is almost at its peak. And sometimes we can be forgiven for thinking that they're fully-fledged allies, just so many things that they do together. Um, and their interests converge in trade and multilateral diplomacy, and their resentment of the Western liberal order, and they do joint military drills together. China and Russia, of course, are drawn to each other by the virtue of their strategic geography, uh, they are aligned on values and views and even personalities of their leaders and President Xi and President Putin are very close. Um, they have, of course, a common enemy in Washington, uh, but they also have natural economic complementarities uh, and they have convergent interests in many areas. Um, but here is the, the, the contradiction or the conundrum of the relationship. Though most of their history, China and Russia, have been either openly hostile or deeply suspicious of each other. And so while Beijing and Moscow are close today, they're also driven apart by historical animosities, uh, power symmetry, uh, competition and overlapping spheres of interest like Central Asia or the Arctic. Uh, they also have deep cultural differences of very different systems and fairly shallow societal links, <coughs> often overshadowed by racism, actually. And the war in Ukraine has sort of at the same time accelerated the relationship, uh, but it also disrupted it at the same time. 
So it's, for example, it has deepened um, Russia's economic dependence on China. Uh, it increased the power imbalance between the two countries. Uh, it squeezed Moscow's diplomatic space quite significantly vis-a-vis -vis China. And Beijing has gained an even more loyal ally in Moscow, but it also gained discounted access to Russian commodities and energy. But its partnership with Russia also damaged its relationship with Europe and even further deepened the rift with the United States. So in this sort of very interesting situation where they globally also Beijing and Moscow are, are sort of building this something that they've preached for a very long time, which they describe as a multipolar world, which is essentially uh, a more fluid system in which the Western power is diluted and Beijing and Moscow's voices, as well as the voices of what they call the Global South, uh, uh, have a stronger voice on the global stage. So it's, uh, it's a relationship that it neither is set to grow nor destined to fail. So it's in this sort of interesting equilibrium. So we're trying to figure out what it means through this program today, but also through a broader initiative. So um, uh, our event today is recorded, so please put your phones on silent. And we also want it to be quite interactive, so please have your questions ready, and we'll have uh, 20 or 15 minutes in the end to, uh, to, to uh, get your questions. Um, let me just introduce our truly all-star panel. Um, one of the leading scholars of China-Russia relations, Dr. Elizabeth Wishnik is a senior research scientist for China studies at the Center for Naval Analysis. Uh, Lyle Morris is senior fellow for foreign policy and national security at the Center for China Analysis here at, uh, at our Policy Institute. And joining us very early in California, Dr. Guo Guan Wu, who is a senior fellow for Chinese politics at the Asia Society Policy Institute Center for China analysis. Um, so thank you very much, colleagues, for joining us. So I'm going to start um, with you, Liz. Um, we're hearing that President Putin is going to Beijing next week. Um, what's on his agenda? Uh, well, first, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, your launch of this important initiative. As a longtime Asia Society member, it's, it's my pleasure to, to join you in this. Uh, so. Uh, Vladimir Putin just celebrated his 71st birthday, so I think he's looking for a birthday present uh, from <laughs> Xi Jinping. And uh, what he would most like to receive is uh, a signed agreement on the power of Siberia 2 gas pipeline. But uh, I'm, I'm, I think he's likely to be disappointed on that one. I think uh, Xi Jinping has many reservations about a second gas pipeline transiting Mongolia. Um, and has been very hesitant to agree. Uh, he would also like uh, additional support, uh, at least in messaging, on Ukraine. And uh, probably he would like uh, Xi Jinping to join him in blaming the United States for uh, the world's ills, uh, the conflict in <coughs> Gaza, uh, et cetera. Um, and um, I think also Xi Jinping uh, w would like some things from him, uh, probably some answers about the, the coup attempt by the Wagner Group, uh, what happened with Kim Jong-un uh, when the North Korean leader visited uh, President Putin in Vladivostok. Uh, so, so I think they have some, some different uh, angles that they will discuss together, and I'm not sure uh, how much resolution there will be in this meeting. Mm. Can I just quickly ask um, a, a follow-up question? How much of the current China relationship is driven by the two leaders? And how much of it is more systematic, do you think? Well, I think they certainly put on a good show of uh, having a bromance <laughs> that uh, they they eat dumplings together. Uh, Putin brings she his favorite ice cream from Russia. They, uh, they, I mean, they they certainly act like they're they're great friends. 
but but I think the the issue for both is is regime security. They see the the other as central to their own hold on power, and so I think it's a more systemic uh, relationship. There are, there are a lot of different government agencies that help institutionalize this relationship. And certainly it's not problem free, but they have a strong political motivation to make it appear to be stronger than it is and to continue it. Mm, thank you. Um, Lyle, can I turn to you? Um, in your paper, you examined uh, sort of Chinese views on Russia um, in the backdrop of the uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. Like, what is um, what is the view of the China's analytical community on Russia these days? Yeah, thanks. Um, first, thanks, Philip, and um, thanks for um, inviting me and um, sharing the stage with Liz, who has a deep China-Russia experience and expertise. So um, I'm very pleased to be joining you all today. Um, as you mentioned, I, I wrote a paper. I mean, I'm, I'm a China foreign policy national security um, kind of um, uh, expert. That's what I focus on. So um, I looked at it from the perspective of China. And I really tried to look at um, how China views the relationship. And um, perhaps some of my points were a bit controversial, but they were based on what Chinese scholars were saying. And, and um, what I found was there's, there's a subset of Chinese scholars who are concerned, quite frankly, about the relationship. Um, you know, I think we hear a lot of Chinese government um, rhetoric about how great the relationship is going. And um, the paper tried to cut through a little bit of that to surface some anxiety, I think, on the part of um, China. This anxiety is driven prim primarily by Ukraine. Um, I think before Ukraine, the relationship was in a pretty good spot. It was, uh, the trajectory was increasing along all facets um, of power. When Russia invaded Ukraine, I think that injected a, a lot of instability in the relationship. And that instability, I don't believe, has been fully expressed by China, um, at least uh, uh, publicly. Um, so just to quickly summarize my paper, um, I think Basically, my, th my theory of um, how China views Russia now is that more negative factors are driving the relationship more than positive, and that's based on the war in Ukraine. Um, I think China is worried about Russian collapse. Um, they're worried about instability, as Liz mentioned, along the periphery, which is um, a, one of China's biggest concerns. Um, they're also worried about a US-led containment policy against Russia and China to the extent that the two are aligned. Um, so my kind of overall summary of the paper is that um, I think that now the reason why China is cozying up to Russia is more a function of a lack of policy al alternatives. China doesn't have much of a choice. China needs Russia. Russia needs China. Um, they are going to align because of um, the relationship as a whole, because of worries about the U.S. and NATO. Um, as opposed to a proactive, um, I guess, diabolical strategy on Beijing to align with Moscow to take down the Western-led rules-based order. That is a factor, but I think what's animating, at least from what I can tell from Chinese scholars, and let me just be clear, I'm not saying that she believes this. I'm saying that Chinese scholars believe this. And given the opacity of China nowadays, we can only derive some conclusions based on what Chinese scholars are saying. Whether that represents Xi is, is un, I'm not saying that in the paper. But to the extent that Chinese scholars do represent a, a um, faction of Chinese thinking, there's a lot of concern. Um, I think as the war drags on, I think that's why you're seeing China push to have a political resolution, because it's not in China's interest, I don't believe, and what the Chinese scholars believe, to prolong the conflict. It doesn't benefit China. It doesn't benefit um, the Russia. And it doesn't benefit the world. So um, I think China is more motivated that, than they have been in the past to bring about a political solution. Mm. Thanks, Lyle. Very good point. Um, uh, just a follow-up question. One of uh, another really good China-Russia scholar, Alexander Gabuyev, um, kind of described China's attitude towards Russian foreign policy is uh, sort of, it's like a natural disaster for them. 
They can't predict it. They just have to manage it. Would you agree with that? That's, a, that's an interesting take. I mean, I think, um, you know, China is responding to its alliances and partnerships that are not nearly as vast and broad as the U.S. Um, and the bottom line is, um, as I said before, um, China, China, Russia is the only power uh, geopolitically to um, align and influence the, the world order. Mm. Uh, China knows that. So China, for better or worse, needs Russia. Um, whether or not they're best friends, whether or not, I don't believe their interests always align. And I think Ukraine is a good example of that, where their interests don't align. Um, but because of, their, because of how Chinese uh, official statements work, they, they can't say that explicitly. Um, um, I, and I will just point out that um, I, I would, uh, urge you to read Philippe Lacour's paper that talked about EU views of China-Russia. And as much as China is trying very hard to um, straddle kind of a middle area, um, they are not engendering goodwill in Europe by their 12-point their proposal that basically um, supports some of Ch uh, Russia's narratives of the war. Um, so I think that China is very much challenged to appeal to Russia in a domestic audience as well as appeal to diplomatic partners who, by and large, are not supportive of the war. Mm. Thanks, Lyle. Let me turn to um, uh, Guo Guan. Uh, thank you so much for joining us so early in California. Um, how do China's domestic political considerations and ideology, foreign policy, economy influence its approach to Russia? And are you seeing any shifts in President Xi's views on Russia and on the war in Ukraine? Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Yeah, so glad to uh, meet all of you online. Uh, yes, I think there have been shifts in China's policy, particularly regarding uh, the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, in the past almost two years. Uh, basically, I have observed two shifts uh initially uh when russia invaded ukraine china's attitude was unconditionally supporting uh russia uh so uh that was actually a very close alliance between beijing and moscow then after uh the russian troops they didn't get what they really wanted to get I mean, so uh, brief resistance from Ukraine people, army, and also uh, very strong support from international society to Ukraine uh, resistance. Uh, also, uh, mm, international sanction against Russia in finance in you know, uh, uh, different uh, areas. So those actively factors. Uh, also influenced China's attitudes toward the war in particular. Uh, basically, after several weeks of the war started, I think Beijing tried hard to find, uh, to hide actually, to, to, to be uh, uh, not really soft, but tried to hide its uh, stance, its true stance. It tried, it, it found that actually Russia was not able to actualize its strategic goal uh, through the war. So then there uh, was long duration of policy, uh, not really adjustment. I would say trying to find a way to say what would happen if actually the Russian regime uh, collapsed, if actually uh, Russia troops were totally defeated and Putin regime would be in danger. So what would be actively affecting Chinese communist regime's survival in China? Uh, so uh, uh, Beijing tried to find something uh, uh, to, to uh, consider this uh, you know, uh, factor. So uh, that's what I eventually led to the you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Morris mentioned, uh, the political solution proposal, peace talks uh, proposal, but that, that that didn't work. 
it's actually uh, China uh, still insists on its initial stance uh, in the way of thinking that NATO's expansion was the cause of the war. So it didn't want to blame Russia still. Uh, so in very recently, I guess basically in the summer of this year, uh, it seems that uh, because the peace, the peace talks proposal uh, didn't work, uh, European societies, international societies basically uh, didn't trust China, can do something to be really, you know, uh, honest uh, uh, meditator between uh, Moscow and Kiev. So uh, China, again, shifted to its initial stance. It basically, you know, supporting Russia with whatever means. Uh, but I think the consideration is different because back to your first question, so uh, what factors uh, most significantly influence Beijing's attitude toward the war and generally uh, uh, Chinese-Russian relations? Basically, I think uh, there are too many, uh, there are two most important considerations. One is grand strategy of Beijing Another is regime security. So grand strategy means Beijing's, you know, general strategy of international relations. As Xi Jinping repeatedly declared, okay, he seeks for, you know, uh, bringing China back to the center of the world stage. Basically means, okay, so to reshape international order data to call international order, led by Western democracies. Uh, regime security, of course, is always priority for the Communist Party of China. But these two factors could be consistent because the grand strategy of, you know, attacking Western democracies is actually offensive strategy for defending regime security. Uh, regime security is bottom line. I think uh, Beijing and Moscow, they shared, uh, they share a fear of their regime being overthrown by democratization, by so-called the color revolution. And that's the basic theme, this basic stance, basic ground for their alliance with each other. So when uh, each of their uh, regime security uh, is under threat and by something, like for example, uh, Russian military defeat. So Beijing uh, would to, would think, you know, how to deal with this, the, the situation. So basically my point is, you know, there are some tactic shifts, uh, but the rationale is consistent. Mm, thank you very much. Um, so uh, the collapse of Russia or chaos in Russia is not in Beijing's interest, uh, a weakened Russia may be in Beijing's interest, but not, not a collapse in chaos that may spread or may affect regime security in Beijing. So I think we, we're seeing a thread here that or at least we're debunking one of the misconceptions about the China-Russia relationship, that it's, you know, it's very solid that they're on the same page. I, I think we're seeing that it's not quite the case. One area that is, um, uh, is, uh, causes great deal of anxiety, uh, especially in this country, is the China-Russia military cooperation. So Liz, I want to ask you, how is it evolving in the last two, three years, and where is it going? Uh, that's an important question. Um, and I want to set a little context for that and respond to a couple of points that were just made. I think uh, another aspect of the shift in China's policy has to do with the nuclear issue, that uh, Russia has been making veiled nuclear threats, uh, moving tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus, attacking the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And I think that's a bottom line for China, mm -hmm. uh, not using nuclear weapons. And although, as Professor uh, Wu said, the, the uh, Chinese peace proposal fell flat. I think the international community does credit China as well as India in restraining 
Russian use of nuclear weapons and, and saying that that's a no-go for the, their continued support. <clears throat> but and another area of difference comes from the Russian side. I think we, we've been talking here about the limits to this <coughs> partnership. And on, on the Russia side, I think Russia has always wanted to be uh, seen as both a European power and an Asian power. Since the days of Peter the Great, if you look at the, the symbol of the Russian Empire, the two-headed eagle looking in the two different directions. Uh, but Russia has not wanted to do this by being um, only reliant on China. So, uh, and even now, when Russia's options are limited, you see Russia making overtures to the Middle East, and that explains to a large degree why Russia has moved away from Israel and, and gone more clearly to support the Arab world in the current conflict, and also to engage with other Asian states. So, so um, against this background, you do see a deepening military partnership between Russia and China over the years. But this has not deepened in a linear way. We've seen ups and downs. If you look at the arms sales, this is an area where Russia has technologies that China lacks. And especially the 1990s and the early 2000s, China bought most of its weapons from Russia. China is under sanction since the Tiananmen um, massacre in 1989, cannot buy weapons from Western countries, so Russia was the leading source of technology. Uh, then there were some concerns in Russia about China reverse engineering Russian technologies. There are some intelligence gathering issues. China, Russia is concerned about China's intelligence gathering uh, about Russian uh, activities. Um, but after the, the first uh, Ukraine invasion in 2014, uh, we, we saw uh, um, new contracts being signed for some important systems, um, aircraft, uh, missile defense systems, and, and so forth. And, and now there's talk of joint production. And so that will be a new marker in the partnership if that goes forward, if they're actually going to go ahead with that. Also, Russia promised to help uh, China with ballistic missile defense systems. We've also seen um, an acceleration of dialogue on security issues. They've, they're now on their second joint roadmap for military cooperation. Uh, we've seen military exercises um, become a, a regular and important feature, both bilaterally and multilaterally. Although those were interrupted to, to some degree by COVID, we're, we see them um, especially uh, around Japan. Um, for example. Um, but I would say this is not an alliance. If we're talking about an alliance from a military point of view, there is no requirement as in NATO uh, for each side to provide military aid to the other. So we see China trying to uh, protect itself from sanctions by not directly supplying military aid to Russia and Ukraine. Although, um, if we look at dual-use items, so technologies that, that are not necessarily military but can be used by the Russian military, by some estimates, almost 70 percent of that comes from China, from Chinese companies. So not state-directed necessarily, but there are a lot of different routes that Russia gets this technology. So I would say you have a deepening partnership, uh, but not an alliance. You don't see the joint, kind, joint planning. You don't see the operational. Uh, coordination um, that you would in um, among NATO allies, for example, you don't you don't see that kind of interoperability, uh, and you do see some competition with uh, Russia being concerned about the uh, reverse engineering by China. Mm. And how do you think the uh, Russia's failures in Ukraine on the battlefield influence Chinese decision making on military cooperation? Does it have an influence at all? Well, this isn't the first time that, that China has seen Russian errors on the battlefield. They, they comment, they've been commenting about Chechnya, about Georgia, and other conflicts that Russia has been involved in. So some of the logistical issues were not a shock to, to Chinese analysts. Uh, but certainly they're watching, military analysts in China are watching how do different technologies work on the battlefield. They're learning a lot of lessons 
from from this. Um, but they don't have many options, as, as Lyle said. Who are they going to buy weapons from? So <clears throat> they they have to um, rely on Russia for a lot of their equipment, although they are increasingly uh, producing their own for most of their needs. But there's certain systems Russia still does better. Um, but they haven't been using those systems on the Ukrainian battlefield. It's 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 also a different scenario than a Taiwan scenario. So the, so the relevance might not be exact. And Lyle, um, Russia has even fewer options um, when it comes to military cooperation. So what do you make of that North Korea, Russia um, cooperation? And we saw the North Korean leader visiting. <coughs> Uh, Russia's Far East on his uh, very incredible train. Um, uh, what do you make of that? What's going on there? And what does China think about it? Yeah, thanks. Um, just really quickly to build on what Liz said about the, um, the effect of the Ukraine war on Chinese perceptions of the Russian military, I do think that um, China was a bit surprised that Russia's had such a difficult time in, in Ukraine think that China assumed that it would be much quicker than it has been. I think the mystique of the Russian military has been um, eroded in Beijing. Um, and I think that does matter when it comes to the bilateral alliance as far as power dynamics. Because if I'm the PLA looking at what's happening in Ukraine, I'm feeling much more um, confident that perhaps my military is a little bit more um, sophisticated and, and might be able, even though they haven't fought a war since 79, is, uh, could potentially be a little bit better than Russia's military. Um, on Just really quickly on Russia, China, Mill, 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 um, I would point you all to Liz's, she has a CNA report that's terrific on this issue um, in which she says that kind of Russia, China, Mill, Mill has sort of leveled off recently. Um, in the past decade, it's increasing. Totally agree with that. Um, I will just point to joint exercises between the two countries. I think they're getting more sophisticated. The scope is larger. I would say that in Washington, D.C., the DOD is paying close attention to what they're doing. Um, they're inc incorporating their Air Force and Navy. For example, the last uh, one year of the Sea of Japan was, was pretty sophisticated. So, um, I mean, it is partially symbolic, but I think it also is operational. And I think the things they're doing is very much practicing what they could potentially do in a conflict. So from a DC perspective, I think it's a little bit concerning about the things they're doing and, and the level of sophistication. Um, but, but as Liz said, it's not an alliance. It's a, it's a partnership. Um, on Russia, North Korea, I, I actually don't think that it's much at this point. I mean, it was there was a lot of. There is a lot of um, symbolism to the visit, but um, I don't think China's worried too much about it, quite frankly, because North Korea honestly doesn't have much to offer Russia. Um, Russia has, I think, more to offer North Korea, but Russia is so desperate at this point that I think it's really telling how much Putin rolled out the red carpet for Kim and how much they're talking about technical cooperation with one of the most isolated regimes in the world who, quite frankly, doesn't have much military expertise to offer um, Russia besides some shells and some missiles, which Russia needs now. So um, I think it speaks to just how bad things are getting for Putin's regime to basically be you know, solidifying an alliance that, from Russia's perspective, North Korea doesn't have much to offer. China has much more to offer Russia in that regard. So I don't think that China's too worried about it, um, simply because of it's not quite too much of a threat for China. Maybe we misread it. Maybe it's all about luxury train technology and that <laughs> really cooperating. Um, um, I want to turn to Go Guan. Um, uh, what role do you think the deteriorating US-China relations or the US-China competition play in Beijing's partnership with Moscow? Is it just a case of a common enemy, or is there more to it? That, that's really a great question. Uh, I think uh, the deteriorating 
Sino-American relationship and the Sino-Russian partnership, they don't have causation. That means one factor is not cause of another factor. Uh, the situation today, uh, if we look at history, I think it's not uh, similar to what we could uh, see in the late Mao Zedong era uh, that happened in early 1970s. So at that time, the worsening, actually the crisis between China and the Soviet Union was basically a big factor to explain why China, Communist China invited uh, President Nixon to visit Beijing and we saw a uh, Sun American rapprochement. So that was the situation at that, that time. Today, I think uh, the relationship between Beijing and Moscow, uh, their so-called partnership with art uh, limit, uh, basically, uh, I would say uh, beyond, yeah, what's beyond is beyond the geopolitics. So as I mentioned, the they shared the uh, uh, they shared actively the fear of uh, you know being uh, democratized. Uh, so basically, uh, I would say uh, the particularly uh, their uh, their their partnership is based on uh, you know regime security consideration and uh, not based on anything like ideology. Yes. Both of them, they are anti-democratic, but I don't think anti-democracy is systematic thing like uh, ideology, communist ideology. Putin, uh, I don't think Putin is communist, but uh, Xi Jinping seems, uh, you know, really uh, diehard uh, that, you know, uh, uh, a communist. So uh, I think the their uh, their their relationship, yes, uh, did. I could that contribute to the world worldwide rise of dictatorship everywhere. So the their common interest is just to keep their dictatorship within their countries and also to resist uh democratic influence uh to their own countries. So that's what I say beyond common enemy, they become uh, still, you can say, okay, so uh, democracy is common enemy, but that's beyond the uh, strategic science, beyond the geopolitical science. The enemy is, should be redefined. Thank you very much. Um, I want to leave uh, at least uh, 15 minutes for questions, but I want to finish the, the panel discussion with sort of uh, a question about where the relationship is going and how would you describe it now? Um, so we we see in the peak of the Moscow Beijing partnership, and where is it headed? What's the best word or the term that you would describe it? And what are your scenarios and predictions? I might start with you, Liz. Okay. Um, that's a tough question. Um, I, for me, I would say, despite all the differences that we've illuminated in this panel, I would say it's a resilient partnership that uh, they each have a stake in uh, the survival of the other regime and that keeps them together. Um, I think they, uh, that a lot will depend on what happens in Ukraine in terms of the balance of power between uh, the two countries. I think China, despite its, its uh, concerns about uh, Ukraine and the Russian performance, still, I think the dominant view still sees Russia prevailing in a war of attrition uh, because they see uh, the West fracturing and uh, the U.S. in decline. And I, I think that those perceptions also shape their understanding of, what, of Russia. So I think if, if Russia manages to, um, to um, achieve some kind of status quo uh, scenario, that the partnership will um, endure much the way it is now. If I think it's problematic for China if Russia wins or if it loses. If Russia wins, then, then you have a perception of China tied to an aggressive Russia in Europe, which undermines its positions there um, in the Arctic and, and uh, in Europe as a whole. 
uh, if Russia loses, then China is left saddled with a very weak partner. And what good is that for China? And um, also Russia, if it's much weakened, might start to fear China. Uh, it's potential territorial ambitions with respect to Russia or uh, in the in the immediate neighborhood. Um, so so I think that we're kind of at an inflection point. It's hard to say if it, if China Russia relations are peaking or not. Um, I think that there's a lot of domestic political reasons that we've just heard for for their continued uh, resilience in terms of these ties so. Thank you. So, inflection point. Um, Lyle? Just 100% agree with Liz, um, as usual. And um, I think what you said about Ukraine is really powerful and, and, and insightful, which is <laughs> it's bad for China if Russia wins, and it's bad for them if they lose. Um, there, China is really between a rock and a hard place because um, they they're really trying to manage, you know, politically how the, an outcome of the war, and it's very difficult. Um, I would use two words to kind of build off Liz's comments, which one is unpredictable um, based on the Ukraine war. We don't really know how it's going to end. We don't, is, China, is China going to be the lead negotiator for a mediation of, a, of the conflict? They're trying very hard. Do they have enough coalition to build, you know, can they build a coalition to bring about peace? Uh, I'm doubtful, but they're trying very, very hard. Um, and then enduring, so it's sort of a little bit of a, um, two dichotomous terms, but it's enduring because of their alignment of against NATO and the U.S.-led world space order, however you want to define it. Um, they see that as not being in their interest. So as long as that is in existence, the status quo does not serve their interests, they have very strong interest to um, combine their forces to um, carve out a multipolar world where China and Russia have uh, larger voices. Mm. Unpredictable and enduring, right. <laughs> um, Go Guan. Uh, 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 actually, it reminds me of uh, why actually uh, Putin invaded the Ukraine uh, at that point of time. So uh, my speculation is that so when uh, Putin might believe uh, in the you know judgment Xi Jinping made, so the West then is declining as the East, the East is rising. So I guess Putin had you know his own interest calculation that if the East is really right, rising, so the East should not be around China but should be around Russia. So that's why maybe, okay, so, uh, uh, you know, one of courses, Putin take, took military adventure in Ukraine at that time. So uh, I totally agree with my colleagues. So that means between Beijing and Moscow, even they share you know, a lot of things, but still they have their different calculations, uh, particularly, you know, they don't want to say uh, the other side of their partnership, uh, Russian to be the dominating power of a new world order, if they can actively reshape world order uh, to their favor. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. That's a great description of it. Um, I want to open to questions. Um, with best, yes. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, my name is Kushbu. I'm from the South China Morning Post. I have two questions that are related. You talked about the, uh, you know, um, the uh, Russia China thinking that the West is in decline and you know it's their time to rise. Uh, how do you think the conflict, uh, you know, Israel Palestine conflict, what's happening right now, and the political dysfunction in capital where the aid to Ukraine has been temporarily suspended, will strengthen? Russia-China relationship and their thinking, further they're thinking that the West is in decline and the U.S. is now busy with, uh, you know, with, with helping Israel. My second question is that how does this conflict really impact the geopolitical competition that we have between Russia and China and the U.S.?
US, because a lot of countries in the global south have not come out, uh, you know, very, um, in, uh, you know, they're not supporting Israel the way the US is or India is. So how do you think this will impact this geopolitical com competition for influence uh, between China, Russia and versus uh, the US? Um, Liz, do you want to take the first one about the West in decline? Uh, <laughs> well, I'll talk more about the, the Global South piece, mm. if you don't mind. So I, I think that's an, that's an interesting question. And we've seen both China and Russia position themselves as uh, leaders of the Global South. And we see that with the expansion of BRICS um, and uh, with the different types of policy conferences they had, China's diplomacy in the Middle East and so on. But I, th I think that, that this conflict is going to contribute to the fracturing of the international community that we've seen uh, China and Russia uh, team up on various issues um, in opposition to the West to um, create their own modes of governance uh, their own kinds of standards in terms of uh, uh, cyberspace or outer space and so on. And so I think here there's another line that they're drawing. But, it, I, but I think it's, it's a, a little bit uh, um, self-defeating for them because it isolates China further from, from uh, the Western countries that they want to engage, especially in Europe. Uh, China used to have quite good ties with Israel in terms of technology that uh, will be harmed by this. And Russia had good ties with Israel, too. And Israel was seen as a potential mediator in the Ukraine conflict, for example, and that will be difficult now. Uh, so it's true that there's a lot of dysfunction in Washington. But here in the US, we're used to that. Uh, we don't see it as, a, as the, the um, initial step in a, in a de decline. I, I think that in China and Russia, they watch Fox News too much, and, uh, and they uh, draw uh, inappropriate conclusions ba based on these, um, these discussions on the, in our media. Um, aid for Ukraine will be found. Biden is working on creative solutions. We, are, we keep finding errors in Pentagon accounting. Um, and maybe there'll be an error in State Department accounting. We'll, we'll find some money for Ukraine. And uh, Zelensky was just in Brussels, and he might go to Israel. So uh, I don't think that that these are two um, uh, zero-sum conflicts where one is going to definitively end support for the other. So that's um, that's a misplaced hope in Beijing and Moscow. I also just want to add that uh, the the vision, <laughs> the vision of international order, is not always compelling. Um, and sometimes it's very, uh, it, it's not quite clear what is it that they offer in as, a, as an alternative world order. And they often do not act in unison. I mean, sometimes they, as Liz said, sometimes they cooperate on some of these multilateral initiatives, but most of the time uh, they compete. Or like you look at the Belt and Road Initiative or the Eurasian Economic Union and in Central Asia, there's a bit of competition there. Um, so it's a, it, it, they also understand that they kind of act from the position of weakness, at least at the moment, not from the position of strength, uh, because they need to present a very compelling new vision for what is that multipolar world actually is. I think the current vision is that, that this is the world without dominating the United States. But that's, that's about it. What's the alternative? And so I think that's, uh, that's an important point. And often uh, they don't see eye to eye when it comes to how do we get to that multipolar world. You know, China is much more systematic. You know, it works through the UN system. It builds its own institution. Russia is a disruptor most of the time. Um, and we talk about it in one of the papers as well. Um, David? So I'm David Zweig, um, Professor Emeritus from uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, who is now settled in New York. Um, I have two points that, that surprise me. Um, one is that I haven't heard the word power transition. 
I haven't heard the word maintaining U.S. hegemony. I haven't heard China feeling, I mean, you've talked about China feeling internally threatened or sort of the, a little bit externally threatened, but to what extent is this not, this fits so perfectly, the Sino-Russian alliance or partnership fits so perfectly with China looking out as a power, you know, it's getting stronger and the United States has, an, according to power transition theory, has the natural interest to, to, to take China on. And China, feeling that threat, is going to look for the one ally it can get, mm -hmm. right, which is Russia. And so I, I asked that question. This, the second question, and it goes in part to Guo Guang, Haojo <laughs> um, uh, Bujen, that we didn't hear that we heard Liz mention only briefly once the word Taiwan. If I'm sitting in Beijing, I think back to the Korean War, and I was about to take over Taiwan, and damn those North Koreans, they screwed us completely, and the Russians told them, go ahead and do it, and armed them to do it. Now I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, my power over Taiwan's getting stronger and stronger, and damn those Russians, they invade Ukraine, and, and we find out about all these sanctions, and we find, we get the, you know, the West united, boy, it's gonna be really tough to go after Taiwan now if we try and do that. So, two, two questions. Yeah, great questions. Um, so I might go to Go Guan for the first one about the power transition, and then to Lyle about Taiwan. So nice to see you here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, really uh, powerful points, powerful questions. Uh, in terms of a power transition, I I think you know Xi Jinping really has miscalculation about uh, international relations. You know uh, of uh, today's world. So uh, that's why uh, uh, he you know uh, seeks for so-called you know big change. Uh, people have never seen in hundred years. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, you know uh, miscalculation. I still want to uh, emphasize his domestic consideration uh, because uh, uh, with China's economic uh, power uh, has been growing very quickly in the past number of decades. So when Xi Jinping came to power, uh, I guess he already planned for staying power for as long as possible beyond the so-called uh, two terms limit. And so in that way, he needed to find, you know, so grand goal for China. That's what he, we just talked about, you know, so reshaping international order. And in that way, so he miscalculate, he actually, you know, overestimate China's power in that way. Okay, so he could say, okay, I brought, I will bring China to, uh, you know, center of world stage, and in that way, I could stay in power for as long as possible. So, power transition, I would say, is basically just the misperception for Xi Jinping. I mean, Xi Jinping's misperception of international relations. Yeah, there are some, you know, uh, components or elements for potential power transition in world politics. But in the foreseeable, foreseeable future, uh, even the United States, you know, power of dominating world order has been declining in some aspects, not in all aspects, in technology, for example, it's not. So, but still power transition is far away from, you know, uh, 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 what we can see today. Yeah, so David, to your second question about Taiwan, I 100% agree. I think it's overall a, it's very negative for the PLA for a variety of reasons. One, you have so much training going into pretty much one mission, which is to invade Taiwan. And that's an amphibious invasion, which is much more difficult than what Russia is doing in Ukraine. So if you're drawing lessons, there's a lot of negative lessons they're drawing. They're looking at sanctions. The sanctions regime is undergoing major changes, the US and US allies, about how to sanction um, Russia and other great powers when they you know, use, invade um, another country. That's only going to increase, become more sophisticated. There's gonna be, I mean, it's galvanizing coalitions that were not galvanized before, which will be similar coalitions for a Taiwan contingency. So if I'm in Beijing, I'm very much concerned. 
about the trends. Um, doesn't mean they're going to veer from their track of their modernization and their intentions for possibly um, using force against Taiwan. It just means that, you know, we would, we would assume that the PLA is giving Xi very frank, I mean, this is another discussion, how much the PLA is learning negative lessons, but how much are they actually incorporating them and, and really briefing their superiors about the challenges of it, right? And that's the whole, that's another civil question about China, which my worry, quite frankly, is, is perhaps the civilian leadership in China is not 100% aware of all the challenges that the PLA is learning from a military perspective. You would hope they are, but um, maybe they aren't. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of um, I, I would say overall, it's negative for China. Last question. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the interesting discussion. I just uh, wanted to ask briefly um, your thoughts on the outcome of the Ukrainian war in the context of the Chinese-Russian relationship. This is interesting for all of us to observe but for me, what is very interesting to know and to predict is the eventual relationship of China and the US. I think the bigger question we need to look at here, what will come out from the solution to the war? Whether it is a conflict-based or peace-based, either way, I think it will further define the relationship of China and the US which is, in my view, very, very more important, much more important in the international relations. And I think that's the big elephant in the room. I would like to have your thoughts. Yeah, Frank. Liz, would you like to have a go? <laughs> that's an important question. Uh, I think that, that China's reputation has suffered from its perceived uh, support for Russia in this war. And that has amplified some of the criticisms of China and the U.S. on human rights grounds uh, in terms of not obeying uh, rules on technology transfers and so on. But it's been more significant in Europe, I would say, where China is viewed as agreeing with Russia in disregarding the territorial settlements that have been in place since World War II. That's taken very seriously in Europe and has really undermined China's effort to split the Euro Europeans from the Americans uh, to their advantage and to split uh, European countries um, with their former 17 plus one and, and so on. Uh, so I, th I don't see this any outcome as positive for U.S.-China relations in the short term. Where because I, I doubt, as Lyle said, that the peace plan that China proposed has any traction because China does not require Russia to leave occupied territories in its peace plan. And also Russia disagreed with the peace plan, as you mentioned in your, your paper. Uh, so um, that's a non-starter. Where China can play a role, though, is in the reconstruction. Because prior to the invasion, China had good relations with Ukraine. They were investing in Ukraine. They, they had a partnership with Ukraine. Uh, so perhaps in the long term, if China plays a positive role in the reconstruction, some of these um, memories of China's apparent complicity with Russia will be erased, and there might be some hope for improving relations between China, uh, Europe, and the United States. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we've ran out of time, but there's a lot to unpack in, in this uh, partnership, and that's why we started this program. So please uh, stay in touch, you know, sign up to the Center for China Analysis newsletters and for our other communications, because we're going to continue this conversation in our papers, in our analysis, but also in, in programs like this. We haven't even touched the economic relationship, which is really interesting, the societal links, mm -hmm. sanctions, so, so many problems to unpack. But I want to first of all thank our speakers, um, and I want to thank you all for joining us in this morning, and uh, I want to thank our members for supporting our work, and if you're not a member, this is a great morning. 
to <laughs> join Asia Society. Um, I also want to thank the members of the diplomatic community that are here with us today. Thank you for uh, supporting our work and being engaged in this discussion. And thank you all for coming. And if you want to have a coffee and stay for a little bit to talk about what we just discussed, please do so. Thank you. <laughs>